Can everybody hear us okay? Yes. Can you hear us okay? Okay. Um, good evening. That was a pretty weak. Good evening. Good evening. Try over the microphone. Um, thanks so much for coming. Um, huge thanks to to Elizabeth and James, uh, to the entire Moed staff, um, and uh, a huge, huge thanks to uh, Alex and Melissa for. Um, bringing Michael Richard's work uh, back to us in such a deep way. Um, it's such an important exhibition. I hope you all get a chance to go down there and see the, the work uh, at the Stanford Art Gallery um, and also to, to be able to participate in the symposium tomorrow. Uh, but it's such an honor to be able to, hear, to be here with you today with William Cordova, um, one of my favorite artists and somebody who is a very close friend of Michael's. Um, and uh, and, and so we wanted to talk with you a little bit tonight about uh, your experiences uh, with them uh, uh, and, and also your understanding of what it is that he was trying to do with his work. Um, maybe hear a few stories about, about Michael and, uh, and reflect a, a lot more on, on um, what he uh, left to us, his legacy uh, to us. Um, but I, I guess I just wanted to start. By, by asking, you know, the two of you had so much in common. You were both um, immigrants, migrants, uh, from the, the, the African diaspora, from the Caribbean. Uh, you from Lima. He was born in Queens, moved to Kingston, and pretty much was raised there. And then you find uh, uh, that you get to meet each other in Miami in the, in the late 90s. And I, I guess the first question I wanted to ask is sort of, what was uh, what were the circumstances uh, around which you met, and what was happening in 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 both of your worlds at that time in, in, the, in the late nineties in, in Miami? It seems like it was a really fertile time for a lot of ideas, uh, a lot of culture, a lot of production. Yeah, I overall I knew Michael for a short time, I would say, like five years. And we both met, am I coming out clear? Yeah. Yeah. We, we both met in uh, fall of 97 in South Beach at Art Center South Florida um, Community Center um, that had studios for um, visual artists. I was coming back from Chicago after undergrad, and he was just coming in from New York doing a residency at the Art Center in, in South Beach. And it was the second day that I was in Miami, back in Miami, and I was walking with my friend Louis, uh, also an artist, Louis Kispert, through uh, the Art Center. Yeah, because Louis had a studio there, but he didn't know people. So we were just walking around, and Michael's studio was open, and we just started talking, and um, that's, how our, that's how we met. And I kept coming back, and until eventually I got a studio, but it was just down, down the door from me. And that's how our, our friendship began. So we were both brand new. Mind you, I, I never lived in South Beach, didn't go there frequently. It was also very different in the 90s and the 80s. I used to go there as a teenager, it's not a place you want to live. It's still in me. <laughs> for, so. for different reasons, yeah. yeah. But uh, back then it was, uh, it was a lot more affordable. And you could do it in a studio for $110 a month. So, which, is what I, which, is, which is what I did. And, and so it was a lot more eclectic. I mean, there's a lot more things going on. And, uh, a lot more diverse. Mm -hmm. So that was the tail of it, the tail end of it, though, because we made it in 97. By 2000, and most of South Beach was already gentrifying uh, Cracker Barrel and all the other companies that were doing. Mm -hmm. And the art center got smaller and smaller. And then, you yeah. said Cracker Barrel? Yeah. Cracker Barrel moved in? Yeah. And that was like the end of the neighborhood? <laughs> 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 oh, no, Cracker Barrel's here. <laughs> well, the gap. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, yeah. And then the long slide 
to where it is now? Uh, I don't go there anymore. I was really interested in the art scene, what was happening then. I mean, you were both young artists. This is a period where like hip hop is just taken over, but it's also a period in which like Tupac had just been killed, Biggie had just been killed. Um, and in the yeah, and and uh, there's a period in which it seemed like folks were trying to figure out um, where to go, what to do, right? And then a couple of years later, uh, Thelma Golden, uh, Studio Museum in Harlem, kind of gives a name to your generation of artists, calling, you know, kind of jokingly post-black. Um, but I'm curious, like, sort of what were the kinds of things that you were, you were thinking about at that time, you uh, and Michael? What kinds of stuff was in the air, you know what I mean? Like, what, what do you guys see each other in each other's work? That point. I think our conversation was extremely critical. Mm. Things that we can't talk about right now. <laughs> Still. No names and, and no mentioning places either. Okay. Um, what can you tell us? 20 years later. <laughs> well, you mentioned Tupac. Tupac was very popular, but I think a lot of the younger generation gravitated to him more so in Miami than Biggie Smalls because of his lyrics. There was actually a pirate radio station in Miami that played Tupac 24 7. Miami is also one of the few places in this country where it has uh, the highest amount of uh, pirate radio stations. They just can't shut them down. They're mobile. But, uh, and I used to know a couple of the, the young fellows that used to go there, and they, 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 they ran the, the Tupac radio station. Because mm -hmm. I think there's an Elvis Presley radio station somewhere in Memphis, but mm -hmm. that's 24 7, but mm -hmm. this is Tupac. Yeah. And, uh, and so they used to go to Office Depot, these two young men, and they have a big book with just Tupac pictures and articles. And anything, everything about Tupac. And Office Depot? Yeah, I used to work there. Oh, <laughs> I see. I used to work in a coffee center on the weekends. And so I didn't have any bosses over me. And so they would come in and just make photocopies of whatever they wanted. And I would just write, order was late, it's free. Mm. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, these smalls is great, great rhymes. But it was about fantasy, mm -hmm. whereas Tupac was not about fantasy, mm -hmm. not not the the bulk of his work. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of people, younger people, gravitated more to that than, than uh, anything else. And yet, one of the things that you and Michael bonded over though was music. You know, oh sure, that was the first thing we talked about mm -hmm. was music. And then he talked about a lot of his work. I think mostly because he wanted me to help him with the sculpture pieces. <laughs> <laughs> It wasn't just me, it was, it was a lot of us who went in um, and helped them. Uh, Miami's a thriving city, like LA, um, like New York. We didn't know how to drive, so we couldn't borrow my car. But, you know, we took turns and go different places to get materials. And it's not, we didn't have a pro large supply store in downtown, in downtown Miami. You had to go an hour south to get your materials. So there's all these things, so we were all, a lot of us were really active in making sure that he was taken care of. Yeah, because it was, he's fairly new there. He didn't, didn't know how to get around, especially in the city. Because South Beach is, it's like a small island, basically. Mm -hmm. And to get out of there, you have to take a bus, and the bus takes 45 minutes, yeah. you know, just to get to the station. Mm -hmm. So, um, so most of our conversations involved music and our work. And then we got deeper into our own backgrounds. Because, mm -hmm. of course, Miami then had a, a larger West Indian community, which has mo moved more west and north mm -hmm. of South Florida. Mm -hmm. um, so it's so interesting because um, perhaps the most popular piece, or the most well known piece of Michael's, is Tar Baby versus St. Sebastian. And it seems as if the two of you started working on that, or you started helping 
Yeah, you know, I started helping him with that, and he showed he just showed me the process a lot. Mm -hmm. He's very generous that way in sharing with um, with the artists that were in the U.S. Resort that were in the studio at the time with the process of the materials. That was all foreign to me. I just worked with performance, film, and, and some drawing in, uh, at, in undergrad. Mm -hmm. And so um, we just, we would meet every day, you know, we talk about every day with his work. That's the first piece we worked on. It was the longest piece also we worked on. But we also uh, worked on other pieces that are, I don't think they're, they're around. One of them I know he destroyed, which is a, uh, uh, the Jacob's Ladder. Oh, Jacob's Ladder. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that would be where we, we worked on that. He drew it out and, uh, in his studio. And then he wanted to know where he could go and have somebody um, weave, weave it with uh, a pair. And so we went to my friend's place in, in North Miami, and my friend Kasha's place. And I <laughs> we we so thought we were going to have to do the TV reporter thing. No, so. I don't know what's. But it, yeah. It's, it's gone. It's kind of maybe the. Yeah. Oh, there you go. That's my okay. <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so we, we had a, a friend of ours make the piece. It took about two weeks, and eventually, when they finished it, uh, he, we picked it up, and there's no pictures of it. If there were, there, they don't exist anymore. They're not in the book. There's a drawing of it, though. Not this one. Uh, taking a lot of his time because he had to get it ready. And I know he didn't finish it in Miami. He had to have it shipped back to New York in order to have it finished. And the idea was to make it out of bronze, but um, he didn't have the funding for it. Yeah. And so he just uh, he rushed to finish it in, in New York. And then in 2000, he exhibited at um, the Corner Museum when his residency ended. The residency was his long three year residency at the South Florida Art Center. And every year, the artists would come to Miami from wherever they were coming from for, I think it was like five months. And they lived and worked in South Beach. And got a stipend for the time that they were there. And at the end of the residency, they all got a one-person show at the Corcoran. Mm -hmm. all, mm -hmm. all at the same time. Can you tell us a little about the process? And, uh, and we, we got these pictures. Did, did he have this on the wall? Was he thinking about um, Ali and the St. Sebastian conflation and no, I, 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 yeah, all yeah. this other kind of stuff? I just added that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it had to do with persecution. Mm. Um, it had to do with, um, what else I write about? Um, I guess my point of reference was not his point of reference, okay. which was with Candomble or Santeria. Uh -huh. And if he was coming in from it from a different point, which was more in relation to Muhammad Ali, because mm -hmm. Ali was Muslim, mm -hmm. and um, so when he, when he did that photo shoot in '67, he you know, he paused a bit, so he had to call Elijah Muhammad about it, mm -hmm. and so that was okay. And so he did the photo shoot. Um, and so I was coming to the piece when I when when Michael was talking about it. I, of course, I've seen Saint Sebastian a million times in in our history, mm -hmm. and um, but I was thinking of outside of that, which is Ochosi, which is uh, uh, an Orisha, and syncretize you know to the uh, Saint Sebastian. In Peru, we have. Um, San Martín de Porres, which is uh, Papa Candelo. Right. The sort of patron saint of the poor. Right. Yeah. And, um, and so I was coming from that, that perspective. Um, just because I was, I guess, pre-exposed to it. And I'm not a scholar on it, but I was just exposed to it through, through family. Um, sometimes, you know, people do certain things around the house or certain 
glasses or certain things, and you don't ask why it's there, you just accept it. And later on, you start being informed by it. So that's that, that's how I became aware of that, more so than anything else. Mm. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit more about the process of how the two of you would talk and think and, and sort of develop and work? Um, uh, you were working on it literally on a day-to-day basis now. Yeah, our studios were about two doors down from each other. He, he, when we worked, we just intensely were privately just working on our own. I didn't necessarily ask him for any assistance or anything like that because I was working on the little postcard size work. But his was a lot more labor intensive. And so he would often gravitate to my studio and then I would assist him. Um, and helping him through the process of uh, making the sculptures. And I think we just had a lot of common, commonalities without bringing uh, Peru or Jamaica. Which is a lot of, through music, um, through, through f- conversations about family that is, is sometimes very difficult. That it's, it's difficult to talk to with your own family or things that are not necessarily shared in families and so that's how i ended up sharing a lot of my personal background with him and and i think that's led him to suggest that i go and uh, apply to the students in harlem as a resident and i think that's something he also proposed to, to artists in general is to try and find alternative methods of alternative ways of, of pursuing your practice without compromising in a commercial art world. Because I remember I would ask him early on about that. He was really, you know, he was seasoned by then. He was, he was showing a lot of different places. But he was also very strategic, whereas he didn't show a lot in commercial galleries. He wasn't interested in that. And I would ask him, but you know, don't you want to be big time? I just got out of school. What did I know? And so he would just break it down. He would break down, you know, these are the sacrifices you make, these are the pros and cons to that. Do you really want that? And me naively asking, well, what about Basquiat? Mm-hmm. And he didn't have too many <laughs> constructive things to say about the process that Basquiat took, mm-hmm. the steps that he took. Mm-hmm. Which is, you know, you cross reference enough things, you find out, yeah, you, you end up sacrificing certain things. Um, same for Jimi Hendrix. Mm-hmm. Uh, makes certain sacrifices, uh, the cost is higher. And it's not something to be romanticized. You know? And I realized that you know, that's not the, the route that I wanted to take. And through those years of knowing Michael, I learned that there was a healthier way of sustaining myself and not necessarily trying to achieve fame and glory for a quick minute and then suffer for the rest of my life. You know, the idea of just being uh, dismissed, you know. He's, at this point, he was, I guess, in his mid-30s. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he's serving as a mentor to folks like you who are, I don't know what, five, six, seven years younger uh, in some ways, yeah? Well, when we met, I was 26, mm-hmm. yeah. 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 He's 10 years, almost 10 years younger. Um, something like that? No. no, I'm not good at that. No, he's <laughs> like, yeah. Um, no, it might be like eight years. Yeah. Eight years, yeah. yeah. Um, what do you think he, he kind of uh, developed that? Clearly, he was studying a lot of his peers, right? What was going on? And, and certainly in his work, there's a whole theme of, uh, I mean, it's, it's a beautiful, in his artist statement, he says, Does the glass ceiling which excludes also reflect the desire to belong? Which kind of, I mean, it kind of blew my mind, right? This, this idea, you think of the glass ceiling as something that you're, you're looking through, but he was thinking of it as a mirror. Um, and seeing reflected back, like, this, this idea of ambition, um, but also realizing very much that, that you're on the other side of this, of this ceiling. You, you can see through it, you can't get there, and you, you can see yourself and your own ambition in it. And, and so I guess I was curious what you thought was where he kind of developed that kind of 
outlook and, and decided because later on, of course, he, he becomes an installer, an, an art handler, and all these different types of museums in New York. Um, but he's very much on his own path. He decides that he wants to take the, the, the route that makes him feel like he can do his work and have control over it, which classically we know Jimi Hendrix and Jean, you know, Jean-Michel Basquiat did not have that when they started getting involved in the game. It was, it was always chaotic in terms of protecting themselves. What do you think that he came, he came to that conclusion from? Yeah, I would say that in the music industry, there's always a one-to-one -one relationship, audience and uh, musician. So you don't have to impress the press or the academics, the art writers or the historians. You don't have to impress them. You can impress one historian in the arts and they become famous. It doesn't matter whether the people like it or not. But in the music industry, you have to impress the public. It doesn't matter if somebody's telling you you're the, the greatest thing in the world. If people don't like it, it's not going to do anything to them. So I think he understood that very clearly and had worked as a preparator to sustain himself the way that most artists do. And he would talk a lot about that. And I didn't want to work that close to the industry in general, so that's why I worked at a copy center place. And there's also not that many institutions in South Florida. It was always a grassroots place, more so than anything else. Now it's not, now it's like a circus, but um, we'll elaborate on that later. <laughs> right. But at the time, it's South Beach. Yeah. yeah. It's, um, yeah, I would say that he made very, very conscious decisions to work a certain way in his practice and to sustain himself a specific way in order to sustain that practice and his ideologies. And that was not foreign to me that I saw he's getting all these museum shows constantly. They just didn't show in commercial venues. And I was inexperienced, and so I just equated both of them. I thought, well, you should show in galleries, you should show in museums, but you know, galleries make money, and it's not that simple. You know, it never is. And so he, he would just talk to me about these things. And I think everything he said is, is, has come to be exactly the truth. Uh, everything that he told me, everything he suggested, he said, he, he still, you know, I, I told him, I said, I don't know how to put a spackle in the wall and like that. So he said, you don't have to do that. You know, just do art residencies and sustain yourself that way. Don't try to be anything else. Uh, I get introverted in public. And so he said, hey, you know, we would go to our receptions and, and I would be in the wall, in the wallflower, just afraid of, of everything. But he said, you don't have to do anything. Just do a residency and let them um, take your work to the to curators to the public. I had never done a residency before. They said, well, you know, I did a PS1 residency. I done a, a student museum in Harlem residency. And uh, later on, he did the LMCC residency. And I remember visiting him there. Um, this is a year before I went to grad school. And while we're still in Miami, I, I kept thinking about what is a residency I should do for you. And it did help my practice. I just ended up doing it for 10 years instead of a couple of residencies. But the first two residencies that I really did do after I graduated were the first, were the two that he told me to do, which is Studio Museum and LMCC. Mm -hmm. you know? And then I just kept doing them uh, up until 2014. Yeah. And it kind of points out to the importance, right, of, of institutions like the Studio Museum or MOAD that are able to support ecosystems of, of young artists of color um, in a lot of ways. Yeah, absolutely. And it's something that I also try to pass on to younger artists, mm -hmm. to students um, visiting uh, community colleges mm -hmm. or just working one-on-one -on -one with uh, local artists in places that I've been to, residencies that I've done. So I'll, I'll just continuously reach out. Because that's something he did for me. He didn't have to share that information. Later on, I found out 
that's rare information that he was giving you about uh, friendly advice. Whereas a lot of successful artists will say, don't, don't tell anybody anything, will you? You know, keep it to yourself. You don't want these people competing with you. But I don't see that because whatever I do, nobody else is doing. So how you can compete for that? And if somebody wants to do a piece and they get the show and I don't, well, that's fine. There's room for everyone. So that part of his legacy in a lot of ways is this notion of building uh, a different kind of ethic, not just a different kind of aesthetic, which is what every artist is asked to do, right? But a different kind of ethic in, in practice. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's something that I, that I still do. I slow down with the residencies. Mm -hmm. I just like to stay in, slow down and stay in Miami with, uh, for my mom mm -hmm. But, uh, but I still reach out, I still travel, I still do a lot of different talks and, and studio visits and organize also exhibits. Yeah. If that's equally as important, if you have access to all these resources, you should share them. Mm -hmm. So so I organize also art exhibits in different places to do that. I wanted to ask you something a little bit different, which is about how you saw his particular aesthetic, right? You were talking a little bit before we, we got started here about the dualities that you saw in his work, and I was wondering if you could explain a little bit more about what you meant by that. Yeah, I think we were talking about Saint Sebastian, mm -hmm. Saint, Saint Michael, which sometimes I would call him that. You would call him Saint Michael? Yeah, or oh, Legua, uh -huh. but not that many times. But, um, and so he'd ask me about that, and we would make a conversation about it, because um, I wrote a, an essay about Basquiat's spiritual influences, which come from his mother's side, more so than his father, mm -hmm. and who was practicing, she was Puerto Rican, and practiced, yeah, practicing the video. Uh -huh. And so you see that early on in Basquiat's work, and then the images on the screen will show you one of his early works from 82, it's a double-sided sculpture piece, which has a Lego on one side, which is, I don't have a pointer, but with the cowrie shells, and then the shoe on the other side, which is the trickster. Yeah. And so, so I thought of as, as twins, or as related, as brothers, in some ways. Right. Yeah. Uh, Heckle and, you know, Jekyll and Hyde, mm -hmm. uh, which you can see, which is that image of one of uh, Basquiat's last catalogs from 1988, and you actually drew that out. So it will syncretize uh, a lot of um, Orishas that way, the Human Torch often appeared a lot in his uh, his work and his paintings, and that's Django. Of course, he didn't. You know, he, he would always put the Human Torch in and put Django in there. So I, th that was the kind of things I would talk about with Michael. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I never wrote it then. Mm -hmm. I never went outside of our conversation, mm -hmm. even when I wrote in length about Michael and I and my uh, our our friendship. It just wasn't in there because uh, these things are internal. They're things you grow up with, mm -hmm. and they just come up during certain conversations, and then they just go back in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's it was a bit strange to write about it um, in notes and, and just to talk about it also. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, maybe explain a little bit more about why you saw in the Saint Michael as the Allegra figure. Well, I, I, because he was. Um, to maybe explain like the Allegra figure, yeah. Well, I would see him more as that, whereas the issue would be Basquiat. Right. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, whereas Michael didn't have the issue side of him. It was it, was, it wasn't that far. He was just very laid back, extremely generous, mm -hmm. and very protective also of his friends. Mm -hmm. And that's something that uh, that was not something that I was uh, used to seeing, in, in you know. In Chicago or, or South Florida, mm -hmm. mind you, I was just coming back to South Florida, but still. So, um, but Allegra being the person who opens the doors, who who yeah. who, who allows, the person also protects the home. Yeah, protects. Yeah, right. Uh -huh. So I saw him as that. Mm -hmm. yeah. That was just my interpretation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit too about how you saw some of his work um, in in relationship to. Uh, here's the piece Winged, which is what the exhibition at 
Stanford Art Gallery is called and, and uh, how his influence appears directly for you. This is a piece that you uh, named for Geronimo. Um, Geronimo one and two, yeah. one being the Apache uh, Indian yeah. and the other one being Geronimo Jijaga, mm -hmm. um, former political prisoner in Black Panther. Mm -hmm. And the one that, the piece that Michael did is actually, he did a video of that piece. It was a performance piece where he inserted a similar um, wings with, um, I think they were made out of metal, I don't know, very thin. He inserted in his arm. Um, whether he did or didn't, I, you, can, you can't tell. It's, it's just his arm, and you just you see him inserting them, or somebody inserting them. And the video, I don't know what happened to it, but um, it's something that I always, I always went back to. But um, and then he made this piece later on. He did it in '98, but it's his third. I guess it's, we finished it in '99. But um, yeah, I was I was thinking of um, of uh, trans like a transceiver with the Geronimo piece. Um, the duality, the real struggle. Um, it's collapsing time. It's not, not necessarily nonlinear, but it's um, aligning two different uh, sort of points together with this um, a brown bag. Under the brown bag is a, a brick, which is a tool, you know, a building, but also throw it through a window. And, uh, and so that's a, that was, I've, met, I've done many pieces that allude to Michael's work or his ideas, but they're not necessarily very little. They tend to be more abstract. Yeah. It, one of the things that said that I just thought of as you were talking about that, you contrast the brick and, and the feathers. The, and of course, Michael, uh, so much of, of the work that we, that has, has survived is about um, flight is about trying to um, the the sort of duality of flight versus a burden, holding a burden. Um, yeah, so transcending, like, yeah. what's that? Transcending, transcending yeah. versus um, being drawn back down by gravity. Right. And and it made me think too of like Kendrick Lamar, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Levitate, levitate, levitate. Um, and 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 so it seems as if like your your piece. And, I mean, you know, maybe Kendrick saw these pieces too, like, are all in conversation in some kinds of well, ways. Well, yeah, I think the mind work more like radios, you know, mm -hmm. uh, receivers and, um, well, transceivers. Mm -hmm. And so, and some of the other images are doing the same thing, they're radios, mm -hmm. they're offering, offering communication, uh, they're drums. Mm -hmm. um, and that one, I would say, is a lot more related to, to flight, mm -hmm. that one and, um, Untitled, um, Uncoded. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then Michael's piece, literally, oops, sorry, has this sort of, has uh, the hands, if I'm not mistaken, um, turning the feathers as if to try to mm -hmm. elevate the, to, to try to take flight with on these, on these single feathers and that kind of thing. Yeah, that was before we went. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of that work was, well, before 97, uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. yeah, I hadn't seen that piece. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of work I didn't see, there's a lot of the work that I did see and I never saw again. Mm -hmm. Things that we made in Miami, sometimes would often make them and then destroy them mm -hmm. um, without talking to or, or if he did, I, I just didn't see them. Mm -hmm. But I also think that our conversation just uh, influenced me to do and create a lot of a lot of my own work and with him in mind, mm -hmm. whether it was conscious or subconscious. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, this piece, yeah. the Band of Gypsies, uh, Greatest Hits, that was made at, uh, within the year that I was a student museum in Harlem. It's a gypsy cat divider that found uh, an alley and became an altar, accumulating objects and materials uh, through the span of uh, eight months. It's a reference to the band Gypsy, Gypsies, uh, Buddy Miles, Billy Cox, and Jimi Hendrix group, which is short-lived. Um, but it's also a reference to 
uh, gypsy cab drivers who are usually immigrants who have degrees, PhDs, um, but can't get work because they don't have certain paperwork in the U.S. and they have to drive gypsy cabs. But I would always uh, share stories, or they would always share stories with me of where they came from. Um, that's something I came into in mind when creating this piece. And um, there's a photograph of Michael in there, next to uh, to Malcolm. Yes. Um, you want to talk about that a little bit, Michael and Malcolm X, the juxtaposition of that? We were talking about a rubber machine gun from a, a prop store that I bought, and so we did a, a photo shoot. And it didn't come out very pretty. <laughs> and so that, that was an outtake. I've never shown them. Mm -hmm. um, that's, can you see it? Very clearly? No. Can you make it bigger? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Unfortunately, <laughs> no. Um, I had another question that I wanted to open it up to the audience, mm -hmm. which is so the, the time that you got to spend with Michael in. Miami was brief, but you guys became friends uh, and stayed in touch. Yeah, I mean, after, I internalized a lot of the things we talked about. It's, it's like pulling teeth mm -hmm. to talk about a lot of it because I just never re really talked about it in length. Mm -hmm. I wrote about it, yeah. but I also edited a lot. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, it just, um, it just comes out that way. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. That's an early piece that. Um, that I saw in slide when he showed it to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, it influenced my friend Lewis mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, to go that route with a lot of his work. And that drawing that I did there um, is definitely influenced by the one on the, on the right. Uh, again, uh, transmi transmitters. Mm -hmm. This the, What you can't see in here is this is a cherry uh, uh, lit up like the Hondas used to be in the 90s when you have the, the lights on the bottom of the, of the carriage and and in this in the carriage part of the chariot is a bunch of bass speakers Yeah, my name would be the Hyundai's Ah, not okay. Hondas. Hondas out here. Yeah, yeah Hyundai's in Miami. Yeah. Okay, but uh, Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a beautiful piece. That, that piece was a uh, from, from memory of uh, when we went to the Gumbe Festival mm -hmm. in uh, Coconut Grove. Mm -hmm. And the Gumbe Festival is, yeah, it's, uh, it's like a Mardi Gras. And uh, there was a lot of stacked speakers on trucks. Mm -hmm. And so that reminded me of the so I did that piece. That's our collaboration, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, wish it were true. Um, it's a little hotel. Monopoly Hotel, and we were just talking about uh, being very transient during residencies, mm -hmm. and I lived like that for a long time, mm -hmm. and so we we took a little hotel and made a mold of it in Port Wax. Well, the question I was going to ask is, is what kind of work did you see him doing uh, towards the end of his life? Where do you think he was headed with his work? Well. Yeah, I, I would have to ask him how come you don't do all these elaborate things. He just wanted to pace himself. To, you have to not go crazy, but try to pace yourself because he, he would talk about other artists who are really successful, um, commercially successful, then who burn out. Mm -hmm. He wasn't trying to do that. He was just trying to pace himself mm -hmm. and make sure that he, he would talk about Kerry James Marshall because I was complaining. So, Kerry James Marshall was the same painting every show. It's like, doesn't he have any more work? It's being naive. Mm -hmm. He said, no, man. What you want to do is show the same piece as many times to get more press from it mm -hmm. while you're still building in the lab, while you're still working and developing other things. Keep showing that. Let them have that. Mm -hmm. And then when you get an opportunity, then you show something new. Mm -hmm. And so he tended to do that. You know, he was always working, but he wasn't always trying to show the new things all the time. He was just trying to pace himself and slowly build up. And so, um, in 2000, he had a show in Miami at a Ambrosino Gallery. It's a commercial venue, but it's not like showing in New York. 
It doesn't have the same type of impact. And Miami didn't have a market, a big market then. It still doesn't actually. We just have a lot more galleries. That doesn't mean that people sell. It's an illusion. But, uh, but he had a show, it was all drawings. And um, um, he, I said, yeah, I told him, what did you make these bigger? No, it's not, there's no need to do that. You just make these. I want the. I want to maintain the intimacy of the work. So he just kept doing those. He had a ton of them, but he didn't want to make a big show either. He just wanted to slowly put them out. And then I realized why that actually works. You know why it makes sense. And I didn't at the time because I was just very eager. Yeah. So it just took me time for me to understand these things. But he was very. Um, just willing to share that information uh, with a friend, and um, I think he did that with a lot of a lot of friends, I mean, people who I who I've talked to also. Yeah, I mean. Why don't I open it up for any questions that folks might have um, from the audience at this point? And if not, I got a million questions. Wrong. Yes, please. Could you stand and answer the talk? Hi, I'm, uh, I'm from Florida, and um, I had family grow up in um, South Beach and Miami Beach at the same time. And from a different perspective, was there any like reaction to the work that was being put out in a negative way or a positive way? Because I know Miami now with the art is completely different than how it used to be, and now with all the contemporary galleries, it's very much a place in the art basel down there and it's very much like a place to be to put out art. Was that something you guys faced or I know there was issues with curfews and whatnot down in Miami at the time. Everybody have a question? Well, I would say that South Beach in the late seventies, eighties and early nineties was was more like the East Village. There's a lot of grassroots, there was a lot of little do-it-yourself galleries, pop-up galleries. A lot of them were with, uh, with music. Sometimes it was reggae, uh, salsa, punk, rock, country, folk. There was all of that. It was all mixed. And nobody was paying attention to any of that outside of South Beach. South Beach had a native uh, reputation. You can watch my device or the film Scarface and see a sampling of, of that reality. Mind you, South Beach was not all that negative. If you, if you, if you grow up in Miami, you know, it's, you see it from a different perspective. But um, the, if the art community there was not necessarily uh, important to the museums in mainland. Most of the mainland showed people from New York or uh, other places. Not all, but not all museums did that. But yeah, it just wasn't. It wasn't supported. After Art Basel, like the Seattle rock uh, phenomenon in '91, when Nirvana blew up, and then everybody from everywhere was moving to Seattle to be branded Seattle artists, uh, so I could get signed. So the same thing happened to Miami after 2002 because the first 2001 Art Basel was canceled because of uh, September 11th. Afterwards, uh, people saw how much there was going on down there and it's a lot of opportunities in real estate and renting places cheaply. And so every, all the artists started moving to South Beach and then they found out it's too small so they ended up moving into mainland and gentrifying everything. And so a lot of communities are still affected by it. Um, I would say there's, the Miami art scene is, uh, I really don't think it's that interesting. <laughs> <laughs> the reason, that, not to dismiss what you said, but I probably would say the same thing you said, if you hadn't said it. Very much a lot of the white cube, the white walls, and the object placed there. 
Yeah, it's sort of like Alan Thicke. Yeah. Or um, The Monkeys. Yes. You know? It's this um, generic version of like, something you've seen already, but it's not coming from the heart. Yeah. And that's because the Miami doesn't have any strong art institutions or art history institutions. I should say Florida doesn't have any really strong competitive art history institutions or studio institutions. It has an art fair. So when the circus comes to town, everybody goes to circus. When it leaves, people have to go and still make a living. So now I don't say these things to be dismissive of where I live, or because I've had opportunities and have now have more resources. I was saying that back then, and I'm still saying it now. And it's not to dismiss the artists that are there. On the contrary, I try to curate as much as I can in South Florida or outside of South Florida with a lot of the artists that are marginalized, which is basically most, especially artists of color. And so it's something that I, um, that affects me and the community a lot. And since I'm part of the community, I, I don't want to just provide lip service. I want to do something. So, yes, please. So earlier you said uh, this quote, which is the glass ceiling which excludes also reflects desire to belong. That's Michael's quote. Yeah. Yes. Well, you you repeated Michael's quote. Could you um, could you go more a little bit more into how he sort of tried to circumvent the glass ceiling, or whether or not he was sort of more? I, I'm sort of interested in his opinions on how um, marginalized groups were treated in the art scene during this time period and whether or not he was doing anything, like you talked about, he gave you that really great advice about do residencies and how you try to pass it on because that's a really great way for um, minority artists and marginalized groups to get their foot in the door a little bit. Could you talk a little more about that process and, and sort of his uh, work towards those efforts? That's a really long answer uh, that has a lot of parts, but um I think by the time that I started doing residencies, things had changed. Not necessarily in a great way. The New York art world was was very different. So to sustain yourself, if you're a person of color, if you're a black artist, you had to do a lot more things than your counterpart would have to do. Because not a lot of black artists were represented in commercial galleries. There were, there were far few in the 90s. Um, a lot of those cha things changed when Thelma Golden and Christine Kim started um, taking a different, um, I guess, direction when you mentioned uh, freestyle mm -hmm. in 2000. And so that strategy worked for what it for what they wanted to propose. And um, and so we started seeing a lot more artists of color in the mainstream market. Uh, I don't think Michael would have necessarily embraced that mainstream market the same way that Terry Atkins did not necessarily embrace that mainstream market. Terry was older than Michael, a generation older. But there were artists like them uh, Deborah Willis. A lot of these artists were from a generations that were not necessarily, they didn't have an, uh, an option. You know, this Barclay Hendricks, who's now celebrated, didn't have a gallery presentation yet. And William T. Williams, the same thing. These are all gays. So it doesn't matter whether you have a degree or not. So I think I also avoided commercial galleries for a long time because of what he, uh, he shared with me. Yeah, he instilled it in me. It put fear in me to work with him. Mm. So. Maybe it might help to, to also read some of the rest of his statement, all right, his artist statement here. Um, he says, does the glass ceiling which excludes also reflect the desire to belong? My current body of work investigates the tension between assimilation and exclusion. By focusing on issues of identity and identification, 
I attempt to examine the feelings of doubt and discomfort which face blacks who wish to succeed in a system which is structured to deny them access. How do systems of representation and the portrayal of success both seduce and repel? I wish primarily to give voice to the psychic spaces in which exist both hope and frustration, faith and failure, and the compromises which must be negotiated in order to survive. And that's, I think that's a really deep kind of concept about our uh, statement written here in this particular period that describes the sort of um, <laughs> the, which uh, describes sort of the, the literally the existential kinds of um, you know feelings that artists of color uh, faced in that particular moment and to a large extent still do yeah not to a large extent what am I saying that's, that's artists of color still do face in so many ways yeah I, I don't think that people see it that way in general because you might see a handful Constantly in the press, but um, but it's not necessarily that way. Yeah, if you if you think about it in terms of music, going back to Seattle Town, people always remember the f only four bands or maybe two. But what about the other hundred? They're, they're, they're still around, yeah, but nobody thinks about them because um, only. There's only only a certain amount of space was made for for those because of you know uh, because corporations were uh, dictating those things in the in, in the art world it's a different type of corporation there's a certain consensus uh, historically where only a certain amount are allowed in and and even though the strategies that have been created to change that to uh, kind of monkey wrench it's still not a, um, it still goes back to, to that, yeah. Thank you for the question. Other questions, comments, thoughts? Well, I have a last question then for okay. you. Um, I guess the question is, is sort of when you think about, uh, you know, Michael's work, um, he's been gone now, gone now for 18 years. When you think about what his uh, legacy is for um, in the arts uh, and in terms of, um, you know, what he left uh, to, to you, to other folks, um, how would you sort of describe his influence? Through his work, through his works, right? Um, how would you describe that? I'm not sure how to describe it, but it's it's felt. I know a lot of people who were influenced by him as a person, as an artist, or his work, and sometimes all together, sometimes one or the other, one of the three, or maybe more. But I think, uh, I look at it, we're, we're just vessels carrying what he, uh, what he shared with us. I guess in a, in a more concrete manner, it would have to take, um, the same way they, they took uh, people writing about Barclay Hendricks, Jimi Hendricks, and um, Jean-Michel Basquiat to critically analyze historicize the, their contributions for it to be to, to take on a bit of a wider understanding of their contributions yeah I think in that context we'd be remiss if we didn't shut up um, the elders of the audience uh, and we've done this um, yes. where we're all here people who laid it down for all of us to be able to be here and continue our work today Absolutely. so thank you yeah thank, thank you, you. Yes. Thank you.